In the previous episode, we looked at probably the most demanding and dangerous job of the cowboy, the terrifying impact of the stampede and loss of life and the inevitable range burial. Even if the grave was marked, weather and time will cause its disappearance. The daily life of the cowboy was hard work, low pay, and usually communal living in a crowded, rarely cleaned bunkhouse. He may be a wrangler, handling a remuda on a sunny day or a single rider when it's not so sunny. Many things are symbols of the cowboy, the rope, or as it was sometimes called, the string, or the whole line, was an essential tool for the working cowboy. The Western saddle is an essential piece in every film made about the cowboy, and perhaps none more recognized than this, the Texas trail saddle from the 1880s. The sculptor, Roger Ayers, began taking lessons when he could find instructors. He also pursued saddle making, and by 1982 was considered among the top 10 bit and spur makers in the country. After settling in Santa Fe, he combined his real life experience as a ranch hand with being a master saddle maker on a project of sculpting a series of iconic saddles of the West. Skill and authenticity are evident in representing one of the truly essential tools the working cowboy needs. The West was not settled by negotiation, treaty, handshakes, or charity. It took weapons, and some have become iconic symbols of the struggle. The legendary 1866 Yellow Boy lever action repeating rifle is seen here in the hands of Jimmy Stewart in the film appropriately entitled Winchester. Introduced right after the Civil War ended, it became the favored weapon of cowboys, settlers, lawmen, U.S. military, and Indians. Chief Sitting Bull owned one. Its name came from its distinctive side-loading brass frame. I don't want you to think I overlooked one of the most iconic symbols of the cowboy, immediately recognized throughout the world, his hat, sometimes called a 10-gallon hat, which I thought was an exaggeration until I saw this. There are simply no words for it. This is Harry Jackson's personal expression of what it meant to be the top hand. The term entitled for the piece is Salty Dog. Jackson describes a salty dog. He must be self-reliant and courageous, with lots of skill and no quit. He must be innately gentle and dominant at the same time. A man who's on horseback even when he's afoot or lying down. Jackson says, it's not used much anymore on the ranch, and frankly, if you use it in a bar, they'd probably think you were just ordering a drink. This powerful work, casted in 1898, entitled Bucking Bronco, depicts the grueling job of breaking wild horses and was a necessary part of life on a working ranch. Bucking was a desired trait for the rodeo, but not for daily ranch life. They had to be broken in order to be ridden safely. In the definitive book on Western Bronzes, a whole chapter is devoted to Solon Borglum. Appropriate title, Solon Borglum, the first cowboy sculptor. Born in 1868 to Danish immigrant parents, Solon was raised in small frontier towns in Nebraska. He learned all the skills of riding, roping, and all that's required to live the cowboy life. He even managed a 6,000 acre ranch while still in his teens. His older brother, Gutson Borglum, the sculptor of Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota, convinced him to pursue art and give up ranching. Borglum's love for the open land is evidenced by spending his honeymoon on a Crow Sioux reservation in South Dakota. In a perhaps unexpected event, Solon Borglum moved to New York for a short period, and then in 1906 became the first artist to move into and become the guiding spirit behind 
the Silvermine Art Colony. Artists who pursue capturing the life of the cowboy come from backgrounds as varied as raised on a ranch to raised in Harlem. Paint the West, that's what I want to do. And boy, did he. Of himself, Oleg Stavrowski said, I heard that I don't exist, that I'm black, having been born in Harlem. I'm from the old country because of my name and that I don't even speak English. Well, of course, none of this is true. He moved to Santa Fe and in his very first year there was invited to the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Stavrowski often depicts the cowboy taking a break, as in yellow slickers, but implicit in Stavrowski's depiction of the cowboy is that it's hard work, occasionally dangerous. An insight into his irreverent sense of humor is this six foot long masterpiece of Western art entitled Jiggers. It really is worth a moment of careful study. Successful architect turned successful artist. Nelson Boren left his firm in Mesa, Arizona to pursue his desire to paint. Boren's art takes a zoom lens into the minute details of the cowboy life. Boots, spurs, chaps, jeans, but often with a cheeky side, as seen in this very large watercolor entitled Watching the Girls. His skill and wit caught on fast among dealers and collectors and virtually innovated a new niche in the Western market, sometimes referred to as the Boots and Butts School. Boren's work is authentic, having worked on ranches and haunted rodeos. The name Maxfield Parish is a giant in art and illustration, but certainly not as a painter of the West. Parrish experienced health problems in 1901 and 1902 and retreated to Arizona for a better climate. He received a commission to illustrate a story entitled Rawhide, which was published in 1904 in McClure magazine and is one of less than a dozen works of a Western theme. Parrish has captured the heat and vastness of the Southwest desert regions. Perhaps the most recognized Hollywood cowboy in his Academy Award winning role is John Wayne as Rooster Cogburn in the 1969 film True Grit. Here, captured in full action, is John Wayne sculpted by arguably the most authentic sculptor since Remington. Wayne and Harry Jackson became lifelong friends and Wayne acknowledged this piece was the finest interpretation of him. Its image appeared on the cover of the 1969 issue of Time magazine, earning the Best Cover Art of the Year award and the only bronze sculpture to appear on a Time cover. A description of the Rooster Cogburn character reads, quote, past his prime, oversized, blind in one eye, a collection of impurities mobilized into action, a courage crazy old man. One cannot end a discussion about the cowboy without acknowledging they develop their own expressions, usually fairly colorful. Cowpuncher. At the end of cattle drives, long poles were used to prod the cattle into rail cars. Little Mary Cowboy. On some cattle drives, a calf wagon was used for newborns. The term applied to the young cowboy tending the wagon. Biscuit shooter, bean master, belly cheater. The cattle drive cook. Mail order cowboy. The Easterner who shows up all decked out but knows nothing. Pilgrim. A greenhorn. John Wayne got it right. Makins. Tobacco, roll paper, and matches. War bag. All the cowboy owns. Extra set of clothes, ammunition, spare parts for his saddle, a deck of cards, a bill of sale for his horse, a harmonica, a few precious letters. Airing the lungs. Cussing. Airing the paunch vomiting after a heavy night of drinking. The West created legends, many real, some enhanced, and some 
fabricated. There are so many legendary stories and figures. This will be presented in two segments. The first is segment 15. <laughs> 